Google acquiring Wiz. I think this is this could be the starter's pistol. Again. Yeah, it's absolutely fantastic. Google has acquired Wiz for $32 billion in cash. If you don't know what Wiz is, just imagine you have cloud services like Microsoft's Azure, Amazon Web Services, Google's cloud, Oracle's cloud. You need to have security between these things. They help do that. It's the largest deal in Google's history. David was there, I think, for some of the other um, big acquisitions. There haven't been a lot of acquisitions. Obviously, we know the wrath of Lena Khan was pretty acute for the last four years. But uh, looking back in history, Salesforce buying Slack, which our bestie Chamath here was an early investor in for $27 billion. That occurred in 2020. And then we had a couple of things get blocked. HP and was it Juniper, I believe, for $14 billion last year got blocked. And so, and Adobe Figma, mm-hmm. Adobe Figma got blocked, blocked, in, the, blocked in the UK, blocked, in the, blocked UK. in the UK, but they, you know, assumed it was gonna happen here. And this is yeah. actually, we talked about this on episode 189, Shamath, Wiz turned down $23 billion from Google. They said at the time was because they wanted to IPO, but now reporting is saying, no, I mean, it I was think, because of the antitrust stuff under Biden, plus yeah. the UK, obviously, go ahead, Shamath, you can take it from there. I think this is the Trump premium. I mean, the problem when that deal was being looked at back then was there was still a chance that there could be a democrat administration and it was very clear that they were anti m a mm. and anti-tech quite honestly mm. and when trump won i think it basically said okay we can now look at these at deals this, their deal got sweetened massively over the year between when the first offer was made for 23 billion and then went up to 32 billion the revenue roughly doubled since the time of the first offer. And then there's some really interesting things in the details. There is a huge breakup fee. We saw the breakup fee with Adobe and Figma. This one is tremendous. It's 10% of the deal size, $3.2 billion in cash. They don't get an investment. If this deal doesn't go through, Google has to give Wiz $3.2 billion in cash. Let that sink in. This company is massively high growth, zero to 100 million in in 18 months uh, when they started. And uh, last year, they passed 500 million in ARR. You know, that puts the deal at roughly 60 times their run rate, and that is a high price. However, they're supposed to hit uh, a billion in ARR this year, which would put it at 30 times forward looking or 32 times, which isn't outrageous because Google probably has Freeberg some concept or Alphabet rather, some concept of how they could increase the velocity of that of that revenue yeah or that it would be a defensive position one of those two yeah yeah i mean just to put it in context right google's cloud revenue is about 40 billion a year and microsoft and amazon's are both kind of plus or minus a little bit around 100 billion a year and so google has kind of been as we know lagging a little bit in the cloud market the the thing about kind of enterprise sales is there's a common strategy, which is you kind of land with a beachhead and then you kind of expand from there with additional products and services. This has been the reason so many enterprise software companies over time from Oracle to Salesforce to Microsoft have been acquisitive and can make acquisitions very synergistic. What that means is you can acquire a new product or a new service and then sell it into your install base or acquire the customers and then cross-sell your existing products or services into their install base. And so you can increase the overall revenue by putting the two together and combining sales teams and being able to offer a combined offering. And so the theory here, and I think this is something I don't understand well enough, is that security has become such a kind of top requirement and, and product category that it now effectively enables a beachhead type model to be successful, meaning you can cross sell the security into all of your existing customers, or there's enough new customers that Google might be acquiring from the Wiz acquisition that they can now bring new GCP services to and, and cross sell into. Now, to figure out how this actually has to make sense. So Google's ROIC is about 30%. That means that when they make an investment, a CapEx investment or a capital investment, they expect to see about 30% of incremental profit per year come back at some point from that capital investment. The capital investment they're making here, again, this doesn't hit their income statement, goes on their balance sheet, it gets marked mostly as goodwill, 
So Google's going to have a 32 billion move from cash down to goodwill. So now they've got this asset on their balance sheet and they've got to make an incremental $10 billion a year profit. So you kind of got to do the math, $10 billion a year of incremental profit against 40 billion of cloud revenue and against 1 billion of WIS revenue. There's a lot to be kind of built here to make this make financial sense. So then it becomes, okay, well, that's a really hard one to kind of think that they're going to get there very soon. But remember, Google's made some investments. I think it's like, more, I think it's a very tricky, you said it earlier, actually, it's a Trojan horse into the other clouds. There, you know, the reason Wiz exists, and Jason mentioned this up front, is because of the value that it creates in a multi-cloud, multi-tenant environment across Azure and GCP and, and AWS. And when the deal was done, one of the things that Wiz said is, hey, don't worry, we're not going to prefer GCP. And it was interesting because I thought, wait, people actually thought that they would just prefer GCP. No, it's the exact opposite of why Google would want this. Because now what you have are your tentacles like think of any other service that any cloud provider provides where most of your revenue is coming from the other clouds. Can you name one? Well, it didn't exist until now. And so I think the strategic rationale is quite clever, which is you start to gain customer traction and workloads in all of these other environments. And I suspect that TK is smart enough to try to pull these workloads back into GCP. So. That, that's like, I think, probably like... Because oh, they were, you're saying, Shabbat, they would have the data, they would be able to course. see from Wiz, like, hey, look, of course, 90% of this this type of job is Why existing on it? Oracle, or it's over here on AWS, or All Azure. three of you would do that if you're running Google of Cloud, course, and Thomas Kurian is smart enough, and they're not going to no. pay... And David, by the way, the other thing that I would say is, I think this is where bankers get this totally wrong, as the observer watching a deal like this, is it's never about the rate of change when you're trying to do a deal. It's always about the rate of change of the rate of change. And the most incredible thing that Wiz had going for itself was that they were basically doubling in months. So the time mm. to double at that scale, you can do any kind of fantastical model with that kind of raw input. Because when that boundary condition is true and you're trying to you know, de-escalate yes. or scale down or weigh down a model, you're still going to get crazy gargantuan numbers that when you discount them back, gets them to this price. So, I mean, congrats to these guys. I don't, I, you know, I would love to find out how does Wiz, because this is, I mean, I'm sure you guys have this question too. How do you build a sales infrastructure that can scale that productively that quickly? That's an incredible thing, you know? Yeah, I wonder how do you, if how a do you lot do of that? people are, I wonder if it's a lot of self-serve. People it's gotta just be sign up and use it. It's got to be yeah, some percentage of it. I mean, I mean, I'll tell you our experience is we had a guy that had to come in and sell it into us and we had a little bit of a bake off and I don't know, maybe we were unique and there's a simpler, lower scale product that's just more mm. pay-go. Consumption, yeah. Yeah. Who knows? Cyan, looking at this, I'm curious your take on big VC because the uh, Series A, $100 million round, we don't have the valuation for it. The B was at $1.7 billion a year later, so maybe we assume it was a $500 million valuation for 20%, something like that, I would guess, maybe a $600 million post. Sequoia Insight Index, CyberStarts all did that Series A. When you look at the B, C, D, and E, those same players all participated. This is another example of sometimes your best next investment as a VC firm is the highest growth outlier in your existing portfolio. Your thoughts on what this means Completely. in terms of venture capital and maybe the log jam that we saw over the last four years, five years of no M&A. And maybe, cause we, you and I came up when like, it was a golden era of M&A and then, you know, the IPO market started to open up with Airbnb, Coinbase, and of course, Uber. Now we're sitting here, mm, what could, if this is the starter's pistol, what could it look like for the VC industry, which is just, been dead. Yeah, I'm going to start with you know years. my thoughts on Wiz. I think it, this is really exciting for me because this is a great example of a contrarian investment. When this investment was initially made, there was not a lot of money going into security. There still isn't. It's an underinvested category. And with AI and the threat of the types of things that can people can build and vibe coding and everything in between, you're going to need better security. And so I'm excited to see that maybe this might become an investable category. I think this is the largest exit ever in the security space. Am I, am I wrong? I mean, I think, I think, I think you're gotta probably be. correct. Yeah, I can't, be, yeah. I don't I'm think I've ever think heard of, of anything this large. M&A wise. Absolutely. Yeah. So 
you know, how does this impact m and I mean, it's still pretty slow out there. You know, some action's better than no action, but like Niantic was just bought by Scopely. Hmm. We're starting to see you some- You were an angel investor in that, right? I was. That was the Pokemon Go folks. I remember you showing me Pokemon Go over a decade ago. Yeah. That's so, amazing. And, and That's and, a Saudi company that bought it? It's like a Scopely. Saudi conglomerate? Yeah. yeah, that's a Saudi conglomerate. And so that exited for $3.7 billion. And, you know, I, I think we're going to start seeing some movement, especially with the new administration. When we How start, long were you in that uh, deal? How many years were you in that deal? Oh, my gosh. The, as soon as they spun out when Alphabet uh, formed and spun them out as their own entity, I there's a funny story for another time about how I got into the deal. Uh, but I, I realized it was my only opportunity to get in as early as possible. And so I stalked the founder and sat at his door. And Oh, tell us the story. Okay. All right. Well, permission, permission granted. You can't say it's a great story. And yeah, that's no, a great tell story. Us. So before Pokemon Go, they had this game called Ingress. And I started mm. playing it with my friends and I started noticing that my friends were doing some really unusual things. They were like charting helicopters and like traveling all over the world to cast these invisible triangles over the earth. Basically, it's a game of green versus blue and who can cast the biggest triangle. I was like, why are these people spending so much time? And not only that, but why are they going around taking pictures of points of interest for Google? Like, what is Google actually doing with this asset was my number one question. Mm. So I realized that Ingress was part of a bigger mapping plan. I mean, if you look at the team, you look at John Hankey, they all come from Keyhole, and they're obviously part of the Maps team and help build Google Earth. So this wasn't just a game. Pokemon Go was a joke. It was basically an April Fool's joke where the founder of Pokemon said, wouldn't it be cool if like, we put Pokemon on the map and we just tried to find them? And John yeah. Hankey's like, uh, yeah, like let's turn this into an Ingress-like game. I went around telling everybody, like, if I had a chance to invest in anything, it would be Niantic. And because they were part of Google, I thought there was no chance. And then I got a call one day and they said, hey, my friend of mine was like, did you hear Niantic spun out? I was like, oh, my gosh, I don't know anyone at Google. Mm. How do I reach John Hankey? And I realized I'd invested in this company called Hintwater and they were giving out game codes on the bottle cap. And uh, I was setting up her ticketing system one day and helping her out in her office. And I saw all these tickets coming in with the subject line that said Ingress Game Code. And I was like, what is this all about? And I just connected the dots and she introduced me to John Hankey. And then uh, I went there with two engineers because I figured I got to show up with some value here. Um, so two badass engineers who were players. We sat on the front stairs and basically sat there and, and said, please take our money. He's like, I don't need you. I've got Nintendo. I've got Google. I've got... And we're like, no, you really need us. Uh, and he gave one of those engineers a job offer pretty much that day. Huh. He gave me a key card to the office. And so I can come and go from Niantic as I please, which is pretty awesome. Amazing. 